Aloha, this is Jason from Hawaii. Welcome to a special edition of the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast. In this episode, I interviewed Freddie Williams II, co-creator and artist on The Bequested from Aftershock Comics. Now let's get started. Freddie, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hey Jason, how are you? And I'm really happy to, to be on the show with you chatting and for for those at home, it's 11 o'clock here, but it's 6 a.m. in Hawaii. <laughs> so Jason got up super early to accommodate my schedule. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And, and um, we'll, we'll get to chit chat and I'll get to reminisce about what it was like to be there a little over a year ago. <laughs> yeah, so it's okay. Freddie, I'm going to, I have to say, you know, um, thank you very much for doing this interview. You know, um, you know, just like I said, thank you very much for this, doing this interview. I reached out to you last month. When I heard that the, um, that you're going to be doing the um, the bequest um, comic book series for from Aftershock, thank you very much. Thank you very much for doing this interview. And I'm also going to give a brief history of like how and me and Freddie, and also I met your wife Kiki. Um, <laughs> we met briefly last year at um, Comic Con Aloha 2020 last February. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it's yeah a lot has changed since then <laughs> <laughs> so much has changed it would be easier to name the things that haven't changed i guess um but yeah it was that was a great show that was our first show in any of the islands and uh kiki and i loved it and it was great meeting you and chatting with you we did a brief interview uh with you there you know just like a i was about to say a one-on-one but i guess it was there was a lot more people in the room than uh <laughs> technically <laughs> um, <laughs> um but yeah i'm, I'm happy um uh, to have a chance to chat with you and stuff and um uh you occasionally will will chit chat and email and stuff and you'll send us these really nice um videos that we like because it reminds us of uh really pleasant times when we were there in hawaii so um anyway yeah let's let's chat about bequest and anything else that you got in mind no thank you freddie thank you very much for the kind word thank you very much So, Fred, just for any of our new listeners, can I ask you, can you just give a brief origin background story about yourself? Just a brief background. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, My name is Freddie Williams II. I'm a comic book artist, mainly for DC Comics. I've done some work for uh, Marvel, but just a little bit, and uh, quite a bit of work for IDW, which does like G.I. Joe and um, Transformers and the Ninja Turtles and stuff. So, um, but I broke in to comic books in 2005 with, um, with DC Comics through a talent search there. And since then I drew Robin and the Flash um, and a bunch of other stuff that no one's ever heard of. And then um, in 2015, I got to draw Batman Ninja Turtles, which was a crossover between DC Comics and IDW. It's pretty unheard of that big companies do big crossovers like this. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, that led, Batman Ninja Turtles led to He-Man Thundercats and then that led to more Batman Ninja Turtles, then to Injustice versus Masters of the Universe, and then even more Batman Ninja Turtles. So uh, that's how most people would know me. I also wrote a book called The DC Comics Guide to Digitally Drawing Comics. Um, even though I don't do all my work digital, I still do like layouts and stuff digital, but um, those are, that's my basic history, my basic rundown. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then, um, so I'm gonna um, kind of tie it up where basically you're known as that crossover guy. If I remember yeah. from, your, from your website, yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> I added that kind of as a joke, but it's totally true. Yeah, most people at conventions back when we had conventions before yes. a pandemic um, would say, "Oh, yeah, you're that crossover guy," and I'm happy to be known like that because I, you know, I just named some crossovers, and then I did a bunch of um, covers for like Transformers versus Terminator, and um, uh, something called First Strike, which had. Uh, G.I. Joe Transformers, uh, Rom the Space Knight and Mask, you know, and, and just a lot of other stuff like that, um, mm-hmm. which I'm um, a couple of Ghostbusters with Ninja Turtles covers that I collaborated with Kevin Eastman. So um, I love that kind of stuff. I'm really happy I'm getting to play in these sort of uh, sandboxes. So mm-hmm. I'm happy to be known as the crossover guy. So I'm going to ask from that point on, because like, you know, we already mentioned that, you know, last year when I met you at Comic-Con Aloha back in February, yeah. Um, you were basically, you guys were almost what in the middle of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was it a, a nine week convention schedule or was it a six weeks? <laughs> Who, uh, you have a, you have a good memory. It was, it was something like that. Cause I'm not sure myself at this point. Um, what we were supposed to be doing was 
and we, we got through the very like a third of the leg of this big convention thing. It was like we did um, a show in Canada and then the Hawaii show, um, then one in Texas. Then we traveled out of the country for um, Australia to two back to back shows there. And then right after, you know, while we were there, yes. it was announced that they were closing all everything down. So uh, quarantine was going to start shortly after that. And we barely made it back to the U.S. And then when we got back, all of the shows that we had planned after that were canceled. And that was about another 10 shows, I think, for the year. So it was going to be our busiest year for conventions mm -hmm. and everything, you know, just like with everyone else, everything got, you know, sh um, scuttled, everything got shut down. So mm -hmm. um, it was going to be like a show a week, every week for five or six um geez i'm not sure i would actually have to look back because it's been so long i'm not oh, sure yeah. but it was something like that yeah it was very busy going to be yeah yeah because and and i'm gonna and if you don't mind because i listened to the spoiler country podcast that was dated back um in back in july of last year you know uh -huh. um, it, and and you can say no to this but can i ask you know how did you know not only did the convention stop for you guys you know for you you know yeah. but you know can i ask you how did it you know affect you guys in 2020 oh wow like, it it affected us in, in a lot of ways yeah it um so other than the conventions which was obviously going to be a really big part of our life just traveling around and all this um aside from that um on the uh i guess more disruptive side of things. Um, I had another crossover book that was lined up that actually got canceled um, while we were still in Australia. Uh, and that, I, I'm hoping that still will, that could be revitalized or be resurrected. So I'm not gonna name the title of it, but it was two, uh, two other properties still for DC Comics and stuff. And um, it, it, like I had gotten an email from my editor while I was in Australia and he was like, well, we're, we're gonna, you know, we'd already been talking about the, the crossover. He was. He said something like, um, "Can you give me the schedule for the rest of your conventions for this year, so we can kind of plan around that?" And mm -hmm. um, and then like two days later, he wrote me back and said, "You know why? Uh, you know why would be canceling it and everything?" So um, anyway, uh, then aside from that, um, so so like when I returned to the states, it was like all of our conventions were canceled and I didn't have a gig. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a bunch of original art purchases. This is all like very sort of behind the curtain, you know, just real realistic ways that it affected us. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of original art collectors that were either talking about purchasing some original art or had begun at like a payment plan where they make monthly payment plans. Mm -hmm. uh, and then understandably, they got concerned and decided to either put things on hold or to back out entirely. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, Let's see. Then uh, now on the, so that all that's like pretty disruptive. And we, uh, I mean, luckily we had, you know, savings and stuff that we just basically lived off of. And I just did whatever other projects that I had in the background. I did have a whole bunch of warm up pieces that I'm just now sort of like putting out and, and online and stuff. Um, and then on the positive side, we took that as an opportunity. We've been talking about moving for a while. Kiki mm -hmm. and I have been, um, and the last five or six years have been so crazy with deadlines. Um, well, who am I kidding? I guess like the last 10 years have been crazy with deadlines, but uh, that we'd never have the chance really to address whether we'd actually move. And if so, all the, there's just so much to doing that. So um, we took that opportunity to, you know, we have a dead zone technically um, and we're not crazy under deadline. So why don't we just, you know, if we're going to move, let's move. So we put together all the stuff that we'd need to, such as, you know, uh, like a list of having to do whatever repairs to the house and then um, getting it listed. And then that sold incredibly fast at the time. We didn't realize that there was such a big, you know, uh, whatever is happening right now in the real estate market seems pretty nuts. The, you know, houses are selling like crazy. Mm -hmm. And then we, yeah, we sold and then um, uh, now we're, I don't know, just everything in the last year, everything has changed. Like my, the, the types of, you know, like no conventions, different types of jobs, because now I'm doing creator own work, which is stuff that, I, that I'm happy to do, but it's just a very different animal. And then a different place that we're living, just everything <laughs> is different. But I, I'm going to say, Freddie, thank you very much for you know, sharing that because the thing is, I just wanted to give the listeners an idea, you know, that 
during the shutdown, not only, you know, we're, you know, we just, I want to give a background, an idea of how as an art, you know, you as an artist, how did, how did that affect you? Because I just don't want, you know, listeners to go, oh, well, you know, they got tons of money or, or you know, I'm sure someone's going to contact them to do commissions, but, you know, but thank you for, you know, sharing that. Yeah. And it over time, yeah, and, and it's, you know, mentally, it's a struggle, you know, psychologically of just not knowing what's going to happen next. Um, there was, um, you know, there's, there's a distribution network that's used usually to, to distribute uh, comic books that's called Diamond. And for, for their own reasons, I'm sure some of which are good and whatever, I just don't know, uh, yeah. they decided to stop uh, all distribution, even at the very, very early stages of the pandemic, yes. which creates like this weird, it's like, um, you know, if you're somebody who wants to buy comic books from a comic book shop, you're interacting with people and then that was like discouraged or everything was was closed down. So then the distributor who would ship comics there is like, wait, should we even be shipping anything? So wait, wait, you know, everything gets put on hold, everyone. And so lots of books got canceled that were in early stages such as mine. Um, people who were just starting their books did the, some of them might've, some of you might've seen like a hashtag called pencils down. Yes. where just lots of, lot, it was just so disruptive. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, you know, even though um, most of the comic book artists still work, you know, all of us work from home or most of us, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, there's a, a different mindset to I'm working from home, but outside the world is normal yes. versus I'm working at home and I cannot leave and I don't know what's going to happen in the following months. So um, like Kiki and I, who work together all the time anyway, we were pretty cozy in our normal work environment. Um, but it just was like a, a, I don't know, just the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. just, uh, just weird, you know. <laughs> no, and the, thing, and the thing is, I'm going to kind of like give um, listeners a time frame too. what, you know, because yesterday, March 23rd, Lucas, the owner of Dragon's Air, is a comic shop that I go to, he reminded me that yesterday was like the first anniversary that Oahu went into lockdown. So basically, you know, his, right. shop, his shop was affected, um, you know, um, and then when Diamond stopped, you know, sending out comics, you know, um, you know, that was, I'm, you know, not only his shop, but another shop that I also go to, you know, it caused a little uncertainty. Uh, but I think what's really good was that for both um, you and Kiki, you guys took that opportunity and then um, worked it into something good where it's like, hey, you know, we have time now, you know, let's try to, let's, we need to do some other stuff like moving and so forth. So that, you know, I, that's really great that you took that time, you know, sort of that, that, that little break to do that. Yeah, if, if there's, you know, whatever the situation is, look for a way to make the best of it. Um, so a, a small version of that would be, you know, we get tornadoes here in the Midwest quite a bit. Um, and this is like such a weird thing to talk about in an interview. Um, but to, you know, like when we're going into like the storm shelter type area, the basement or the mm -hmm. safe room or whatever you have, um, I always take, um, you know, either a list of stuff that I have to answer in email so I can be typing while I'm, <laughs> while I'm cramped in there waiting for a tornado to kill us. Or uh, I'll take like a page that I can just do inks on that don't require, because sometimes there's just like noodling sort of rendering that you can do that doesn't require a whole lot of brain power, um, mm -hmm. but it just takes a lot of time. Um, so that's like a small microcosm of it. But if there's, you know, when bigger events happen in your life, assuming that you have the sort of mental bandwidth to deal with it, which is a challenge, um, and, and we don't always succeed, you know, Kiki and I don't always succeed. Uh, it, it's that, you know, it's good to at least try to make some sort of positive out of it. So, um, and, and that's actually how the creator own um, bequests came about because we, um, Tim Seeley and I, yeah. Tim Seeley, the co-creator and the writer on bequest, um, he and I worked together on Injustice versus Masters of the Universe and had a really good time, you know, getting to know each other and just, we enjoyed working with each other. Um, and so since so many projects were being canceled, we were like, you know, we have no control over what Diamond does. We have no control over what DC Comics or Marvel Comics does, but we can control, hopefully, um, making a cool product that a publisher later can 
either sign on to or if we can find a publisher early. But you know, you there's a lot of work that can happen without having a, a distribution network set up at that time, assuming that it'll eventually open back up. Yes. But even if not, there's direct sales where you, you know, through fulfillment centers and stuff can can also try to make that distribution yourself. So um but that's what, you know, that's uh Tim Seeley and I had been talking about if we did a, a project together, what type of thing we would do. Yes. And that's you know, we decided, hey, you know, let's seize this opportunity and just start working on stuff and, you know, not just sit there quietly, not doing anything. Let's get to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so, and then this, what you're talking about, you know, the bequest from Aftershock. Now that the first issue came out on March 17th. Um, can, um, can, how did this, how did the book come about? Like, did Tim yeah. call you or? It was um, when we were working, when Tim and I were working on Injustice versus Masters of the Universe, Tim impressed me with his knowledge of the He-Man lore. Mm -hmm. And um, he came up with some really clever narrative tricks to kind of get us into the, into the crossover. And what I mean is in a general crossover, there's a, um, you know, you as the reader know who the good guys are and the bad guys, but the, the good guys and bad guys don't necessarily know who each other are. Yeah. So you can either be kind of labored with um, the good guys trying to suss out if they can trust one another, even though the reader already knows they can trust each other, mm -hmm. um, or you can tr try to figure out a clever way narratively to skip past that. And uh, Tim had, had impressed me with how he had set it up where in the, um, in the Swamp Thing universe or in his, um, his history or whatever, there's something called the green, which is like this, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. it's like an interconnected web. It's like a, it's a, it's a internet made out of plants or, you know, something like that. And yeah. there's no, there's no dishonesty. There's only like communication of information. And um, uh, that's a cool concept in it by itself that already existed. But uh, Tim was able to use that to connect to Mossman, who's a character plant based sort of character in uh, Masters of the Universe. And so basically they could see through the green since everyone trusted Swamp Thing and everyone trusted Mossman uh, through the green, they kind of verified the trust of each other. And then, so we could just get on with the story. And I, uh, that might be, feel like a small thing, but I, when I was reading the first script of that, um, it just impressed me. I was like, that's really clever. We can just jump into the action now, uh, mm -hmm. into the greater story. And uh, so when Tim and I would hang out, we went to a couple of press junkets at San Diego Con, then later at a, a Power Con. Mm -hmm. um, we just started chit-chatting what we would do if we were making our own creator own thing. And he was throwing out a bunch of ideas, uh, some of which were just so, uh, oh man, I, I don't, I don't want to, uh, oh, whatever. It's such a, it's such a wonky and funny idea that I want to say it, but I'm just not going to, cause I don't want to steal his thunder if he uses oh, it. Yeah. But, um, anyway, though, uh, we, we, uh, one of the ideas that we had was what if we had fantasy stuff in a, a modern setting? And of course that's been done before, but what would we do different? And the, the line that got me was um, when Tim said, there's a subplot of interdimensional arms trading of firearms for like magic wands and stuff. I mean, he said it probably better than that, but I was like, yeah, that's, that's a really cool idea. Um, so then we just started building upon that. Um, now, later I found out that actually some of these characters are Tim Seeley's uh, uh, D and D characters from whenever he role played in, in high school. Mm -hmm. So, um, some of the characters were already mostly formed uh, because of that, because he had already done uh, the legwork, you know, 20 years ago. But um, we we put together just I started throwing around ideas back and forth, and you know, stuff started to coalesce, and then it built from there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then just for our list, because I've read the first issue, but for our listeners, can you just give me like the elevator pitch of the bequest? I think I think you already touched upon it already. But... Yeah. Um, I'm so bad at that, even though I've said, like, because I said the one line that got me about the international, or, uh, interdimensional arms trading, but I don't, there's other themes to it that I'm not sure how to sum all that up, but it's, oh, okay. I mean, it's like an interaction between fantasy, you know, fantasy characters are displaced here in the modern era to, um, to stop the inner, the interdimensional arms trading of magic for guns, mm -hmm. uh, but some of the other subplot stuff is like the bad guy whose name is um, Epoch, Kriev. Yes. He's actually my favorite. Him and Relic are my two favorite characters to draw and just in the story. And 
um, Epoch is, he's a bad guy, but his, oh man, I don't want to give away. <laughs> don't, don't give away. Like, I just want to, I just want to no. talk about how cool he don't. is. But his, okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't. <laughs> because I'm going to say, because now let me talk about, because like I said, I read the comic and then um, Relic, now correct me if I'm wrong. I'm hoping I'm seeing the correct um, character. No. Relic um, is the um, African-American character in the comic book, uh -huh. right? Okay, yes. now I'm not going to spoil, I'm not going <laughs> to spoil his, you know, who he, you know. Yeah. Because it was, a, now, it was great. <laughs> good. Yeah, he, he's like, you know, he's very proficient in magic, but visually I like to draw him. Um, I mean, he, he's a cool character, but I like drawing him because he reminds me of back before all this stuff came out about Bill Cosby and stuff. Yeah. Um, it feels like I'm drawing Cliff Huxtable. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, that's in my mind. It's like a mix between Cliff Huxtable and Morgan Freeman or something. Um, yeah. And I, when I was younger, again, before knowing all this, you know, all this creepy stuff with Bill Cosby, he, you know, Cliff Huxtable was like very much a father figure in mine and a lot of other people's lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's fun drawing an action book with Cliff Huxtable Mm -hmm. doing magic there's something about that that's really funny and, and fun well okay and then um no. <laughs> well, <okay. laughs> all right so i'm gonna touch upon i'm gonna i'm gonna move on <laughs> okay all right cool i'm gonna touch upon so okay so you already said that you know tim had already these characters these were his D, &D some most of them were his D, D characters correct um so let me ask you this uh, um how big of a D and D fan were you back in high school? Uh, pretty big, yeah. We played as a system called AD and D, so Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So it wasn't the very because I'm an old guy, but I'm not quite that old. Um, the I was around for the like the revised rules or whatever it was, um, and I had like three or four friends that we role played five or six different systems, um, but D and D or AD and D was was one of the top three. I think the top three were. Uh, Marvel, so the one with the column shifts, that role-playing system, um, the uh, AD&D and then Palladium books, but we also played stuff like GURPS and Car Wars and the, D and, uh, the, the DC role-playing system and a bunch of other stuff. We just, oh, Shadowrun, all that stuff we played, but um, AD&D was, was um, definitely a big part because we spent, you know, you might spend like a couple of months to a year in that system playing different characters but your brain is kind of immersed in that uh fantasy realm or something and i'm um, this is kind of sort of the off the cuff um did did you like buy the books or did you have the books or you know um i had let's see so i had very few D, &D books i had a friend in high school named brad um who we role played but he he ended up buying I don't know probably fifteen books or something like the core books and then expansion sort of source books. I had the Palladium books, so like my contribution is if we were playing Palladium, I'd bring all those. Yeah. Uh, he had the D and D or AD and D books. Uh, then we had another friend, um, my best friend in high school at the time was named Tyrone Crockett. He had all the Marvel books, mm -hmm. uh, all the uh, and then uh, we would just pick up other stuff as we went. But yeah, I didn't. I don't think I owned even a single D and D book, but. Um, I had a, I have an awful lot of D and D character, that's for sure. Okay, and then um, <laughs> let's see. Um, you already talked about like you know again going back to the characters in the bequest that you know most of them were um, Tim's creation. Um, yeah. Did you come up with any of the characters? No, um, no, I came up with um, I, I never I didn't come up with any of the characters as far as like from from scratch or whole cloth. I did all the visual designs. Um, I contributed to, um, so the w part of what Epoch's um, main motivation is, is uh, like there's a deity that he had devoted his life to, and um, that deity essentially forsook, forsaken, I don't know how to say that in the past no. tense, but um, he forsook <laughs> the, uh, the sort of clerics guild or, you know, the house that, that Epoch was a part of when he was a much younger, devoted, devout individual um and so that character that god the deity that we're talking about is named sworn the all-seeing so his motif is like about the all-seeing eyes and stuff 
Yes. Um, and so uh, the closest I got to creating a character from scratch was like, that was very much a castaway or like a off the cuff um, description by Tim of who, what sworn this deity would look like um, or what, what his role was. And once I turned in the character design form, uh, Tim was like, whoa, this guy is so much cooler than he was in my mind. We have to use him more. Mm-hmm. So he's becoming a bigger, not that he's like in throughout the, the the story a whole bunch, but he just became less of a throwaway and more of an important or imposing um, impetus for the for the story. So, um, but no, I did not create any character from, from scratch, um, whole cloth or whatever, but I did design all of them visually. And then we talked about the motivation and that sort of thing and what the roles would be in the story. Okay, so um, for um, you know, for this series, did you know, did since you and Tim worked together before, did would Tim give you like full scripts or just here, hey, you know, I've got this idea, he jotted down plot ideas, or how did that work? Um, yeah, he gave me full scripts. Uh, Tim is very open to collaboration and to suggestion and to revision. But I think his brain works where he needs to have a, he needs as a writer to write it in full to know if he's going overboard with the amount of um, exposition or whatever. So it, it becomes a full, I mean, it's a full script and it's, you know, incredibly useful. It's the backbone of what I need, but I think in a way he needs it to be full just for him to make sure his pacing's good. Um, but he was also very open if I, I thought I could combine a couple of panels into one. Uh, there was a couple times where I could see like, he might've written something for three to four panels, but I thought if I did kind of like a collage image yes. where they don't have individual panel borders and they're overlapping images and it's like a part of a close up of a face and then there's like a small minivan driving and stuff like that where it can show the passage of time and a conversation that's happening. He was very open to all that all those types of changes so um so a full script but very flexible with how i was interpreting it okay um i know now correct me if i'm wrong so i know you know of course we already talked about you know how you played D in high school now yeah. correct me if i'm wrong you actually you and kiki are big elf quest fans correct <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely okay yeah, you have a you have a good memory um yeah the uh, elf quest was like one of the things that um, that kind of bonded us in our very first ever long form conversation. Um, so Kiki and I went to the same high school, Washington mm-hmm. High School in uh, Wyandotte County in Kansas. And uh, but she's a uh, she's two years younger than me in school. So um, and I had very few friends. I hardly spoke to anyone in, in school or whatever. But we had a class together called Principles of Technology, which sounds very sophisticated, but it was just like hands-on sort of um, how to use an electrical meter to measure voltage and stuff like that. So there was a little bit of physics and a little bit of electronics and mechanics. And anyway, this class together that we had, we spoke a little bit and I really liked her sense of humor because Kiki is a very funny, very strong willed and no nonsense person. And I love that type Mm -hmm. of personality. And so we, uh, we spoke a little bit in there, but not by much. And we, you know, I had no social group really. And she was very popular um, in school. And then a couple of years later, after I had graduated and then the year she graduated, which was 97, um, we had like an overlapping friends group. And so we got reintroduced. And this, we had this like epic four hour conversation on the phone one night where it didn't start off to be that way. We were just going to chit that. But um, we were talking about her, like, cause she, she reads all the time and she, She's read Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit a bunch of times. And I had never read that. I still haven't. And then I said, well, I haven't read that stuff, but I was really into this book called Elf Quest. And Elf Quest, as an aside, when I was 14 or whatever, when I saw it, um, was one of the books that made me want to draw comic books for a living. Wendy Penny, who draws it, was way ahead of her time with the, you know, the type of visual influences and in her storytelling. Uh, she's a fantastic artist and great. It was a great story as well. Um, and Kiki was, although she was a part like of a very popular group of kids in school, she was kind of a closet geek because those things were not as mainstream as they are now. Um, so she would read all these things, but kind (laughs) of, but not talk about them to her friends and stuff. Um, so ElfQuest, whenever I mentioned that, she was like, oh yeah, I love ElfQuest. And I was like, what? Because I'd never met anybody who'd ever read ElfQuest before because I... (laughs) 
you know, didn't really talk to many people. But to me, it just felt like I'd met a billion people and she was the only person who knew about it. Um, and then she goes, yeah, there was like, uh, there was this book, an ElfQuest book that I always checked out from the library. And then somebody ended up checking it out, never returning it. You know, they stole it. And I was like, yeah, I'm the one who stole it. I am the one who stole that book that Kiki used to check out from the library. Um, mm -hmm. And when, and she was like, huh, uh, and, and so I ended up, you know, I had it on hand and I actually looked at the library card and it had her name in it, mm -hmm. in the back of that book that I had stolen. So um, this was ElfQuest book three. It's a reprint, you know, like a, a trade, yes. a oversized trade. And um, it's a wonderful book. I mean, I, I suggest anybody who's listening to go pick up Elf, some ElfQuest stuff. It's beautiful work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now on a side note, I did. I did contact that library and ended up paying for that book. And I had to pay like 40 something dollars, which is like twice as much as what the book would have been worth brand new. Uh -huh. It was like heavily used. It's all curled up. We still have the book, but it's definitely not in new condition. So I ended up having to pay in the long run a lot more for the book, but it has like a sentimental uh, connection or value to it. Cause Kiki and I, bonded over this book um when she saw it again when i showed it to her she like hit uh, not not hard but she hit me on the shoulder and was like you jerk <laughs> because you stole this book you know like this is the book that i wanted to check out and i couldn't because you stole it <laughs> no but i mean freddie thank you very much for sharing that story because um, <laughs> i'm gonna let our listeners know because um the um, podcast that i listened because you shared that story on that podcast spoiler Spoiler country, it's, it was such a great story. That's why if you did, and thank you for sharing that again. I thought what's pretty cool about that story, it's almost kind of like that, that old saying, like, you know, um, ships passing in the night, you know, type of deal. <laughs> it's like, you, it's kind of, like you said, it's like you would borrow it, then, you know, Kiki would borrow it, and then you guys bonded over that book. And it's so, what's really cool was you guys, you kept the book you know who, who cared about the monetary amount but it was just more of a sentiment of value that yeah that that it was that's just pretty cool yeah and we've purchased we've purchased like the the other reprints that kind of went in that same series so they're like these brand new much more pristine looking books mm -hmm. next to this one that's just all beat up that will just and i even asked her i was like do you i was like half-heartedly asking her do you want to get rid of this and get a new one she was like no no, this is our book. So um, I was, you know, and I, I'm cool with that. Kiki's very, um, I don't know, she's awesome. So I was, I was about to describe just a few elements of her personality, but she's, um, I don't know, we're, we're joined at the hip all the time. We just, we work together, travel together and, yes. and you know, uh, live together, obviously. But even whenever I've got like a free evening, I'm just like, hey, let's hang out. And she's like, are you sure you don't want to go do something either you know, are you sure you don't want to hang out with other people? I was like, no, I just, I can't get enough of you. So we just hang out together. That's really nice. No, that is really nice. So <laughs> that's, that's going to lead me to my next few questions. So um, since you and Kiki are big ElfQuest fans, mm -hmm. any of the, um, was, was any of the ElfQuest, did it influence um, any scenes in the bequest? I'm not just talking about issue one and don't spoil anything like anything upcoming. <laughs> <clears throat> no, honestly, it, it, I don't think it does. I mean, elf quest in the way that I was so heavily influenced by Wendy Penny's work mm -hmm. that there's, I think there's a little bit of Wendy Penny's artistic DNA built inside of me, you know, from a long time ago. Um, but no, like it, visually the elves do not look like the elf quest elves. That would be something I would have loved to draw on. Um, mm -hmm. And for anyone who hasn't seen elf quest um, <clears throat> in D and D the elves were like six foot plus. They're very slender and tall. They're, they're more like Galadriel and Lord of the Rings, that type of an elf. Mm -hmm. um, the elves and elf quest, they have a, a kind of a, a group or a, a race of elves um, called the high ones that are like that they're actually even taller and more wispy and very thin um but the mo the majority of the elves are like very small they're like around the i think they're like three and a half foot tall or something and they have three three fingers and a thumb um <clears throat> and they have a kind of a 70s aesthetic as far as the now the book was made in the you know mid to late 70s and then through the 80s but they have kind of a 
it just works really well. There were, they've kind of got bell bottoms, but everything has like, you can see where the, the leather uh, leggings have been stitched together mm -hmm. and um, it, like vests that kind of feel like maybe it can, comes out of like um, classic rock or something, mm -hmm. maybe from that aesthetic. But I would have, uh, I could draw that stuff from memory because I drew it so many times when I was younger. Um, and eventually I want to draw some book that has elves that are inspired from that uh, visual uh, lineage, but no, this is much more in the D and D realm as far as elves and other uh, races. Halfling, uh, there's a halfling in here, an elf, a deity. There's a, oh, a couple. There's a dragon. Eh, just stuff like that. So, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm I'm running off the beaten no. track track here for from your question. No, no, no. That that's fine. Um, and I'm just going to ask, and you know, did he? Did Kiki throw any ideas? Um, actually, let me <laughs> let me step back. Was Kiki excited to hear that you're going to do like this fantasy, um, you know, this book about fantasies and so forth, the bequest? Was she excited about that? Yeah, uh, what Kiki said was that she wants. She's like, I'm excited to see you do things that you've wanted to do, mm -hmm. and that includes drawing fantasy. So, I mean, she, she didn't say it as, that was like the underlying message of what she yeah. was saying. So what she was saying was, I know you've wanted to draw fantasy for a while. Are you going to get to draw the stuff you want? And I was like, yeah, some of the stuff. I mean, it's yeah. like that. There's a creator owned thing I have in mind where I might just write it, pencil ink it, you mm -hmm. know, color it, whatever, just all of it. That would maybe have everything, yes. um, but it would be, it might just fall flat on its face because it's, it would be too weird you know too too many amalgams of things because it's the stuff that i just want to combine together mm -hmm. or whatever so this has a more grounded mm -hmm. if you can you know there's literally you know magic and dragons and stuff yes. like that in the story that is still grounded in some way because there's uh it still takes place in our world and there's like ak-47s and stuff like that in yes. there yeah. um yeah so uh yeah kiki was was excited for me and she also said are you gonna have a chance to draw any horror stuff because like does this veer into the sort of mm -hmm. dark horror slasher or just whatever just mm -hmm. is that something that i want to draw and i said no not this one mm -hmm. um but uh, i would love to draw something like that as well so uh yeah she, she's just a supportive person in general um yeah <laughs> okay. well, thank you for answering that question so the horror stuff i'm going to get back to in a little bit but um i'm just going to ask did kiki throw out you know did she throw out any suggestions like hey you know if, wouldn't it be cool if you did one scene where they're here on earth or did did she you know throw out any scenes to you for you to draw or anything for the book no, um, she did not throw out any scene ideas. Um, most of most of the scene, because like uh, Tim basically came with a, um, a, a through line of a plot, mm -hmm. and then I threw out a couple of ideas, and then I just told Kiki about it afterwards. Okay. Um, I was showing her designs and stuff as we went, and she would say, um, "Oh yeah, there's another character uh, character type in here. It's a fairy. Sorry, I just remember that." Uh, but so she would say like that's cool and then she would sometimes say well this other show that i'm watching which i can't remember at this time as she said the name um like she would say make sure not to go too far into this type of idea because mm -hmm. that's already happening in the show okay. and because that's something i wasn't watching so um and i was like yeah we're not going that way but it was like her just looking out for us to make sure we didn't go down a already established plot you know oh no but yeah no but that's really good that she's kind of like uh that's good that she's kind of keep you guys on track because I yeah. can see where if someone reads a book or like, hey, that was in whatever show, you know, it, it kind of, it might pull the reader out for a little bit. So, but that's- It could, yeah. Cool. And it's hard to avoid that. I have to be honest from on a, the creative side of things, so much has been already created that, you know, there's the, there's like, there are times that you go, I'm, I'm hitting this vibe and it works because even though you've seen it in a few places, it's like a, a new twist on it. Uh, but you're still touching on something that somebody else has done in the past. Um, and then and then on the other side of that line is, this is just too close to that other thing. Yeah. Um, but then if you go too far afield where you're, you know, combining two things that are too far apart, um, it then feels like it's jarring. So there's like a very fine rope to, to walk on these things. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we've done it, at, you know, in Bequest. I mean, I, I know I, when reading, you know, uh, what Tim had written, I never felt like 
that this was derivative of anything else. I actually felt like, oh, that's cool. I can't wait to draw that. Like uh, there was different parts of the story that I was like, I wish that this could be expanded to 10 more pages just mm -hmm. so I could indulge, indulge myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Um, last question about um, the bequest before I move on. So how fun is it to be on a creator own book? How fun is it to play in your own, you know, your, you, know, you and Tim to play in your guys' own sandbox? Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, we're working with Aftershock Comics, which is a independent publisher. And, but it, that it, it's, it's run and owned uh, by Mike Martz, who was an editor I've worked with at DC yes. and at Marvel. Um, I love Mike. He's, a, he's an awesome guy. Just on a personal level, we, even when we weren't working together, we would occasionally just check in on each other to see you know, how each other are doing. And um, we'd see each other at shows and stuff. So uh, it, he's, Mike is very open about letting the creators do their thing. I mean, he wants to be like looped in to what's happening, but I've never seen him put down an idea or veto an idea. Um, he's been very flexible because yeah, I was talking about how that we moved. Yes. Um, all yes. of that disrupted some of the schedule, but we started very far in advance. So actually like issue one just came out and I'm almost done with issue four now. So that's mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit of lead time. Um, and uh, he's been very open with just letting us do what we wanted to do. So there was even a uh, double page spread that shows the, the history of um, Epoch, the, yes. the main villain in this, that... Um, it's pretty, it's just kind of weird, like mm -hmm. weird in a, in a way that I wanted to draw. It's like the character's dead center in the middle, which is something yes. that you don't usually do. And then on the left-hand side, um, his origin, his history is told in, um, if you've ever, this, this is going to sound really strange, but in the medieval times, there was something called the illuminated manuscripts that were, um, and this is in reality, this is not just something I made up, but it's like these really ornate stories or sometimes it would be used to illustrate um you know biblical stories but other times it was just like history of other things happening like about a king or his lineage but it's there's like all this ornate decoration drawn in like the borders um and in the margins and stuff and so we use that as an influence on the left hand side telling epoch's history and then on the right hand side mm -hmm. it's like it jumps ahead to the modern day because now he's in in this story or whatever it, he's now found a way to breach the world and come into our realm mm -hmm. and um so then it goes to like security camera footage yes. and the, the edges of i mean this is probably nothing that i anybody else would pick up on but what i'm it's like the edges of his body are making all the panel borders yes. kind of conform around them and um the the edges of the security camera footage I, I drew it, hopefully people can pick up on it, that it almost feels like it's glitching or something because it can't, yeah. like he's, he's too intense. <laughs> it's such a, um, these are the things that keep us entertained at three in the morning when you're drawing because you're trying to hit your deadline, you know? It's like, <laughs> oh yeah, he's so intense that even the video camera footage can't quite touch the outside of his body. I don't know, it's yeah. so weird. But um, that's the kind of thing, if I had turned that in at DC, I'm almost positive they would say we can't put a, a character right in the middle of the, of the uh, spine. Um, because you have to like, basically, you have to do some stuff in the printing to make sure that you can see both sides of the figure. Yeah. And, um, but you know, Mike Marsh is like, yeah, it looks cool. You know, he, he was just totally um, on board for it. And just as long as we were enjoying it. And I think as long as he could see a reason behind it, then uh, he was very open. So anyway, it's just, it takes, there's, there's a freedom that comes with it. Um, there are some additional pressures that come with freedom where you're like, oh, wow, I'm used to having these confines. Now I don't have those confines. Well, am I going to go crazy? <laughs> am I going to go crazy with this? Um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's been great. Uh, and I, I enjoy doing the creator-owned stuff. And I, I could see myself doing more of this, you know, on other projects or more issues of bequests. It's just, it's fun to get to do, to have your suggestions taken more seriously and stuff. Yeah. No, but yes, and I, I know this is, we're using the audio and I'm looking through, um, the bequest, um, the first issue, and I'm looking at that that double page spread. It's incredible. I love it. And then what's That's really sweet. nice is that um, uh, Epcot, how his character, because it it's perfectly centered, even though you know there's the you know the page separating, but it's it's perfectly centered. It's really nice. And then Which just, is 
Sorry, go ahead. And sorry, and on, on his left side, the computer, um, the security cameras, now I see, now I see like the little glitches around like his, that uh, shorter pad armor. That, I didn't catch that, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that silly? I mean, it's, oh. uh, it's, it's fine that it's there. It, to me, it's silly because like in my mind, it's a big, it, to me, it feels like this big creative breakthrough like when i'm doing it i'm like wow that'd be a cool idea um, but i you know, it's it's easily overlooked because it's just not very obvious you know no but it's also what's also cool too because like you know after the security footage you it kind of go you know i'm looking down about how you know he's using all the weapons from our world you know um into you know his realm but then what's really mm -hmm. nice is that like sort of like the 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 kind of like the pages um um, his background origin page under the security camera, you can see all the little like either burnt holes or the like, burns. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it, <laughs> it match, but it kind of matches because that's great with like it matches and it makes sense with the security camera being glitchy in our tech, you know, for our technology. So it's pretty. That's pretty cool. <laughs> no, I'm Thanks, not, yeah, I'm, he's so intense that metaphorically he's burning the parchment that his. Because those, those two pieces of parchment are more like his goal. It's almost yeah. like that's what he wants in his mind. So this is like, oh, you're almost peeking into his journal in a way. Obviously, yeah. he wouldn't draw these things. But but his intensity is burning the paper or something. You know, he, he has such a passion to want to, you know, achieve his goal. Yes. Um, that, uh, yeah, it's starting to, it's it's glitching the, the video stream and it's burning the parchment. <laughs> Oh, that's it's pretty cool. All right, thank you, Freddie. Okay, so I'm gonna start moving on. Um, I'm gonna ask, can you promote your website? Yes, yeah, um, it's freddyart.com. My uh, my name is spelled with an I E, so F R E D D I E A R T.com. And I've got, um, I mean, there's a lot of work artwork on there that you can just look at. There's some pretty good resolution scans that people can just look through all of my just look for the original art section you can look through stuff even if you don't buy stuff there's price tags on there but there's i even kept up the artwork that I already sold just so people could look at it if they wanted to yes. um uh, because there's something I, I really enjoy about seeing the texture and ink wash and a lot of that work is in ink wash which is like diluted india ink it kind of looks a little bit like a watercolor um there's also um like little poster prints and there's comic books and you know sketchbooks and that stuff for sale if anyone's interested, but that's, um, there's a lot of you, that you can look at just for free as well. Now, going back to the, to the comic books and like, um, the, um, excuse me, the comic books and so forth. Um, correct me if I'm, because I looked through the website, um, correct me if I'm wrong, because you autograph it and it comes with a certificate of authenticity. Is that correct? Um, everything comes autographed for free. The certificate came with um, only certain books, so oh. uh, it'll it'll say if it comes with that or not. Um, and part of that was um, there was for some time, like a uh, with the Batman Ninja Turtles books especially, there was a lot of variant covers and stuff, and there was some not an issue, but there was some importance at some point being put on if this came out of my personal collection or if this was just a batch of stuff that I, I don't know, had gotten from someone like a publisher or something and then, and then just, you know, signed and sent out. So um, uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, there's a chunk of the Batman Ninja Turtles books uh, that are either signed by just me or signed by both me and Kevin Eastman, the co-creator of the Ninja Turtles. Uh, that have that come with a certificate of it's a certificate that authenticates its um, the authentic authenticity of it, but yeah. also that it came out of my personal collection. Okay, no, but I think that's pretty cool because you know because I, it's kind of cool. So it's like you know if a, um, if uh, you know um, a fan wants to buy something from your website, at least they know it's like if it's signed, you have that certificate of authenticity. So that's, that's pretty cool that you, on some of your books, that's, I think that's really good. Um, also too, on your website, you also have tutorials. Can you just mm -hmm. go over like, you know, go over that, like what, what does it cover and so forth? Yes, I have. Um, so I, I wrote the book, The DC Comics Guide to Digitally Drawing Comics uh, many years ago. And um, the way that I work is still very much as I describe in that book. So like the ink hybrid method where you're doing a digital layout and then 
uh, printing out that layout either in light blue or gray or black, depending on what you're doing, and then you ink right on your board. So it, it basically keeps your board clean from, you didn't erase a ton of times on it and your layout is hopefully better. Um, but the reason I bring that up is, you know, I'm not even selling that book, <laughs> but yeah, you can, you can get it on Amazon or something. Um, but the reason I bring it up is because that book led to just other, other tutorial stuff. So I have a section on my site called, uh, whip. So work in progress art, and it's got, um, uh, two columns of links. I need to update the links, but, um, there's, cause there's a few more demonstrations that I haven't had a chance to put up there, but where you can watch, uh, videos that I've made, or, um, there's a guy named Evan Burse who runs a uh, YouTube channel called comic block. Mm -hmm. And Evan would, uh, back when we had conventions a few years ago, mm -hmm. uh, or, <laughs> he would come to San Diego con when I was there. Cause we used to attend every year and he would, um, basically have this camera rig where he would do a time lapse of me drawing a piece for him. And uh, I would show the tools I was using. Every time I would switch tools, I'd hold it up to the camera so you can get an idea, mm -hmm. hopefully, of what tools equal what part of the job. Yes. And uh, But I also made my own videos as well. And uh, some of these are time lapsed, and then some of them are just heavily edited down, but in real time. So anyway, uh, those are the tutorials. Um, there's also a section of DigiArt Quick Tools that have um, yes. some tools for sale. Those are usually for use in Adobe Photoshop, which is the digital program I use. Um, and then there's also a couple of uh, like free tutorials kind of, um, you know, sprinkled in amongst the DigiArt Quick Tools as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then um, now this is from John Mail from the Comic Book Page Podcast, uh, yeah. actually both the Comic Book Page Podcast. Um, he's asking, like since conventions have been on hold since March of last year, are you accepting any requests to do commissions at this time? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As long as, as long as there's kind of an understanding that it's going to be in between my regular um, deadline schedule work mm -hmm. then. And so it might take two or three months or something for me to finish the piece. Um, then yeah, definitely. I have a, I have a link on my website on the left-hand nav bar that says commissions and it gives the standard sizes, and standard rendering and um, you know that sort of stuff. So you can just see the price list. And, um, but if there's like a specific thing that you have in mind, you can just, there's links to my email to you know, shoot me an email from my website and um, just let me know what you have in mind and then we can talk about the specifics. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna continue on some right now. My next set of questions is gonna be looking towards the future. Yeah. You, and no spoilers or anything. It's, you can just, it's going to be like one of those simple yes and no questions. <laughs> so do you have any other projects lined up besides the bequests? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, now, our, now, next question. <laughs> so, around. Now, um, I know you and Kiki are big horror fans. So um, would you like to do a horror comic sometime in the future? Absolutely. Yes. There was right when we got back from Australia um, last year, um, whenever everything else had been canceled, uh, one of my previous editors who was, who's now turned into a writer, a guy named Peter Tomasi, who he was, he's the one who gave me my first job at DC Comics um, on Seven Soldiers, Mr. Miracle and on Robin and stuff. And um, he's now a, a writer and a pretty popular one. And he contacted me about a horror book that, um, Sean Cunningham, who's the one who co-created uh, Friday the 13th, the, that movie series. Yes. Um, Sean Cunningham had this idea of doing this comic and I was going to be the artist on it. <clears throat> um, and we were basically two steps away from starting. Like we already had a, uh, well, whatever. It, it, oh man, it, I just really want to draw that. <laughs> but we, uh, um, we got very close and then with just complications of, of all the lockdown and stuff, I think it just, his production company kind of got cold feet with it. So we ended up having to, we put it on hold for like a couple months and then it just got canceled eventually. So, um, but anyway, yes, I, I'm just saying I've had a couple of near misses. Um, I've been talking to, uh, a couple of publishers who specialize in just horror to talk about what, what it is that I have in mind. Yes. Or what, what kind of project that, because I don't know if I could just write it myself, but maybe they already have a project that just has the same sort of vibe of what I'm looking for. So anyway, yes, I would love to do a horror 
book or a horror, horror series or something. Um, horror and fantasy. I love superhero stuff, don't get me wrong, yeah. but I've been drawing it for like 15 or 16 years. So I would love to keep going in the, the fantasy and the horror uh, route. Okay. And then I know you said that, you know, you, you're thinking about, correct me if I'm wrong, you're thinking about maybe either writing it or maybe teaming up with someone to write that, you know, a possible horror series or a mini series. Who would you like to team up with? writer wise oh wow i honestly don't know I, I have had i've had so much experience working with writers who who are really good at different things in the superhero mm -hmm. uh, sort of tropes that that sort of neighborhood i'm not really sure at, at right at this moment who i might want to what name i would put out there to work on a on a horror thing i'm not really sure um I mean, working with Sean Cunningham, the Friday the 13th guy, that was, of course, a very exciting proposition um, where we'd be working with him, but Peter Tomasi was going to be writing this, the, the actual story. Um, that was, you know, going to be perfect, but um, I'm not sure. Okay. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, if I could just name a name, it'd be like Joe Hill, uh, Stephen King, which Joe Hill is Stephen King's son, but I mean, he's amazing just on his own. Uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, even Grant Morrison, I think, because he gets sometimes into weird body horror stuff and some of his weird scripts. So, um, yeah, but those are those names are in such high demand. I don't know how realistic that is. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, now, Drew from the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast, he sent this question because now we're we're just going to be shifting gears right now. So, okay, where do you see the comic book industry going in 2021? I do not know. Okay. It's, it's like, it's like um, knowing the lay of the land previously, but then this big heavy fog has obscured everything. And then it, it's like caused the landscape to shift. So um, I'm just not sure. I really don't know because when lockdown first happened, it was the idea was that, you know, we're talking two or three months max. Let's delete, delay things for four months just to be safe. And then, because that's what all the convention type, you know, all the convention organizers were, were emailing to each other. Yes. And um, then it's like, oh, oops, I guess we just have to cancel. Well, let's postpone until early 2021. And then all those are going, well, let's just cancel for this year. I don't know what else to do. Yes. So I really don't know either. Um, the while um, during, you know, during the quarantine and stuff, there was a bunch of layoffs at warner brothers not just in dc comics but warner brothers owns dc mm -hmm. and there was like d uh warner brothers at large let go of i think like 200 people or something mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. a, a chunk of those people came from dc but a bunch of their own warner brothers people and um i'm assuming there'll be you know uh, fewer books fewer yes. mainstream books um but I really just don't know. Yeah. Those, are the only, those are the only certainties that I know, but it's facts that are already in evidence, so to speak. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, where do you see yourself in a year or two from now? Career-wise. Oh, career-wise. Uh, let's see. Um, I see myself doing a few more creator-owned books and... I don't know, hope, hopefully having a little bit more input on the story end of things. Um, I enjoy co-plotting with, uh, with writers, even if it's like in a non-official capacity where like some, some publishers have this thing where, you know, if, if somebody's listed specifically as a plotter, they have to receive some sort of monetary benefit. Yes. Uh, and that doesn't sound bad on the surface, but it t usually takes it away from the writer mm -hmm. uh, because they're saying, well, if this person is doing some of your writing job, you don't as much of that rate. Um, and that's not really my goal, but I, it's not to get the money from the writer. It's more like uh, what JT Kroll and I did on Captain Adam, which was, uh, that was probably the most interactive of a project that I've worked on um, that wasn't creator owned, <clears throat> pardon me. And that was where, you know, we just, we talked on the phone about, you know, 30 ideas or something, mm -hmm. just random stuff. And as we went, we were both making notes of what we thought had a better chance of being cool or working. Mm -hmm. And then um, usually JT would write up while I was getting back to drawing, he would write up um, sort of a summary of what he thought would work. And then he'd send it to me and I would bounce stuff back and forth. <clears throat> and it's not like he was 
asking me what I wanted to do to ask for permission. It was very much a JT, you are the writer, you have veto power, but thank you for letting me make suggestions. That was very much how it was. Uh, and we've had, a, we've had a little bit of that with um, James on the second volume of Batman Ninja Turtles and mm -hmm. other projects in general that they're open to input. But that was the most input I got to do on, an, uh, on, a, on a project in recent history was with JT. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to do more of that kind of thing, just yeah. the, where there's more of a back and forth. I think both of us benefit from that because I get to you know, have, I don't know, more of a feeling of, of um, fulfillment and that I've gotten to contribute. I'm usually getting to draw things, more of the things that I want to draw. And then usually the writer, I think what they get out of it is sometimes just having your, your ideas discussed yes. will, you know, between two people will bring about better ideas. It's like it, mm -hmm. it starts to hone some of the motivations of the characters and, and it might generate or negate scenes uh, here and there. So anyway, uh, I would like to do that kind of thing. But as far as a specific project, I mean, I would love to draw a, a Ninja Turtles solo project where it's either, you know, a one shot or a mini series, um, uh, even a GI Joe thing. I love Cobra Law and Serpentor and all that stuff from the GI Joe animated movie. That's, you know, I'd love to draw a Transformers thing. I'd love to draw more Batman. It's, it's all open. I don't know. I'm just trying to ride the waves and <laughs> figure yeah. out what I'm doing here. <laughs> no, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to start going into the fun questions part, and that's a great segue. I know this is off the cuff. I didn't because um, you talked about G.I. Joe, Transformers, Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any of the action figures? <laughs> I do have a few. Um, I had a whole bunch when I was younger. Of mm -hmm. I had a couple of Ninja Turtles Yes. But I had a lot of He-Man and Thundercats, um, and I ended up uh, giving some away and then selling some at a garage sale. So <clears throat> our collection now is, is you know, Kiki will occasionally get me like a Batman black and white statue um, or, you know, and those aren't really like, can't play with those, but they're just oh, cool looking. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, let's see, I have, uh, actually the majority of my collection is from what people have brought me at conventions where... You know, uh, somebody who likes the artwork that I do, they'll they'll come up and bring me either an action figure that made them think of my art or sometimes a custom figure. I have a custom Robin that looked just like the Tim Drake that I drew. Um, or they'll bring up, a, you know, just like a little, um, a, what are they, like a placard or something that has the characters that I've expressed interest in. So that's the majority of our collection is, is stuff that family members have given us for gifts or that we've gotten at conventions you know, as gifts as well. I was like, you have amazing fans. <laughs> <laughs> I hesitate to use the word fans because uh, it feels weird to say I have any fans at all. That's like a weird feeling. So I usually say like people who collect my work or okay. readers yeah. that like the comics, but that doesn't, that's not to correct you, by the way, no. you can say whatever you want, but I'm, that's, that's why I usually don't. <laughs> it's just like, I'll say I'm a fan of other things, but yes. it feels weird to say, Yes, my fans. <laughs> That's such a strange thing. And, you know, whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. I'm going to continue on with the fun questions. Now, Great. Um, um, now I'm going to try to pronounce this artist's name because if I remember correctly, he was like kind of like a, inf uh, correct me if I'm wrong, he was like a big influence um, for you as a comic book artist. Travis... Sh Sh <laughs> yeah yeah um it's so i've pronounced it i've pronounced it probably 12 different ways and i just mispronounced the word pronounced so you know i it's it's easy to to get it wrong i believe it's Chere is mm -hmm. the last yes. i believe it's a french pronunciation but i don't even know that for sure i used to when i first saw his name in print it was travis cherist that's yeah. how i would say it cherist with this really hard consonant um but but you know let's just sidestep if we got the correct pronunciation but yeah Travis's work is amazing um his work there was a certain time frame in um the mid 90s that his work evolved in the course of about a year it evolved over like what you would normally expect to happen in a decade it just kept evolving and he went through so many like a rainbow of 
of rendering styles and uh, compositions and complexities where at the very beginning he was admittedly very much a, influenced by Jim Lee, like almost a Jim Lee clone. There were some pages that just looked just like a Jim Lee drawing, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm a huge Jim Lee fan. So even that was appealing. And then he started moving towards a, <clears throat> like the faces started changing in the proportions and structure, less rendering or different types of rendering. Then he went to this very blocky, almost abstract way this was on Wildcats throughout issues like uh, 14, 15, 16, but he did other stuff too, um, where it went into this almost like an abstract um, negative space. Almost everything was negative space or like these very strong compositions though, very good compositional eye. And then he went back to like this super heavy rendered style, but being influenced by Mobius, yeah. um, the artist. And that was on X-Men uh, Wildcats, mm -hmm. um, gold or silver i can't remember it's the one where they're on world war ii and it's okay. zealot and wolverine and stuff um just amazing stuff and mm -hmm. then he went to eventually went into like fully painted work when he went to work on uh, meta barons which is a french uh french production uh this oversized books uh that uh jodorowsky had written and it's i mean that whole I'm on board for all of that, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's all fantastic. And the very first time I saw his work was in the back of a book called Wildcats Trilogy Number 2. It's drawn by Jay Lee, not Jim Lee, but Jay Lee has this very scratchy, um, abstract horror. Actually, he, he would do some really good horror stuff. Um, and in the back of that book, there was a, a four-page preview of Wildcats uh a book called Wildcat Special, which was like an annual, like a 50-page uh, annual or something that was going to come out. And these were, is a four-page preview, and it was just the black and white line art, so just the inks, no colors on it. And when I first flipped to it, one of those pages looks a lot like Jim Lee, like a ton like Jim Lee. And I thought, oh, cool. It's like, you know, I'm getting to see a preview of Jim Lee's, you know, artwork that Scott Williams had inked. And then I flipped, flipped back a page to get to the credits where it said what this was from, and it said penciler Travis Shere, inker Scott Williams and it um it's like I was staring at that book those preview pages slack jawed and I thought this is a brand new artist and and in my mind I thought this was his first published work like this guy just came out of nowhere mm -hmm. and this was this you know I almost cursed just then um <laughs> this amazing artwork um and this, I just assumed this was his like freshman endeavor, you know, his very first work out there. That's not the case, but it actually demoralized me where I wanted to stop drawing. I felt like um, it's so good. Mm -hmm. it, it just knocked me back and made me think I can't compete with this guy. Oh my God, it's just so good. Um, and even now it's way better than the stuff that I do. If any, you know, all you guys should go collect the old, you know, Travis Sheree stuff. He doesn't do a whole lot of work now. It's just like covers and stuff. And I'm, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, <laughs> the wealth of his work is from back in the mid nineties. Um, and, uh, but then it, you know, it's like it, be, it went from being intimidating to inspirational mm -hmm. and it is the main inspirational since then. I love his work. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, since then I did see some of his older work that was still quite good for mm -hmm. a new artist, yes. but it was a far cry from his more developed work. And um, so that, that kind of reinforces, okay, everyone comes from somewhere at least, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he he, he didn't just pop out of the womb fully formed yeah. um, like he was, you know, a deity jumping mm -hmm. from Cronus's uh, stomach, like in the Greek mythology, you know, fully formed. Ta-da! Um, anyway, yeah, I love his stuff. How, how come you asked, though? Is, is he an artist that you've been collecting his work or you recently saw or something? Well, actually, I'm going to say, actually not, because I've seen his um, stuff in the, in the 90s. But I'll be honest with you, back then, it's like... I, you know, the only names I remember would be like Jim Lee and stuff like that. So, sure. and of course, you know, I remember you mentioned his name a couple of times in podcasts. Uh, I had to look oh. up his work again. I was like, oh my God, I've seen his work before. And I, you know, I recognize, you know, who he is now. Yeah. But the reason why I'm asking is for two questions is, do you own any original of his artworks? Nope. Oh, oh, actually, I own a sketch card, I guess. So technically, yes, but no, I don't own any originals. I have um, any any time I've seen a, a decent scan of his work online, I'll download it. Uh -huh. And I actually, I still and I still like study that stuff, yeah. um, like uh, like it's a, a textbook or something. You know, I look through and see what material did he use here. Why did he make this choice in the background or something compositionally? Um, but no, uh, other than that sketch card, I don't own any of his work. 
Now, now my next question is, have you ever met him? Nope, I have not. Uh, yeah, he, I, I think he lives in France now. We've been in France one time for a convention in late 2018. He was not at that show or anything. And to be honest, I, I think I would be, I would feel intimidated to go and talk to him and stuff. Um, there's, you know, there's like the, the, the type of God tier in your brain where it's like, you know, I'm afraid if I go and speak to them, I might make a fool of myself or, you know, what if they don't like me or what if I don't like them? That's even, <laughs> that's even worse outcome. So, um, you know, that's, that's a danger of meeting your heroes. Um, so anyway, no, not, not yet. We'll see maybe one day. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm going to continue on fun questions. Um, on your website, um, I see that you're, now correct me if I'm wrong. Are you a big Phantom fan? Uh, Leaf mm -hmm. off. So, ah, so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm a fan of the Phantom. Um, did <laughs> I'm trying to think of how I could um, read to you the foreword. Did you ever see the foreword? And Okay, so in i can't remember what years a couple years ago i drew a cover that they used for uh the cover of a trade paperback mm -hmm. <clears throat> did you ever see that or did i talk to you about that no i never saw it and, and when we were at the convention it was like you know because you know i didn't want to take too much of your time so but no we never talked about that so yeah okay i have to yeah, have was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i did a cover it was great it was a great experience you know um doing the cover and then um Kiki's grandmother, who she's actually visiting right now, uh, who we call Nene, that's like a, a term of endearment, kind of like Yaya, but it's Nene. Um, and uh, when Nene was, she's like 87 currently. And when she was younger, her father owned a general store and they had comic books that you could purchase for, you know, five cents or 10 cents or whatever it was. Um, but they also had a policy where you could bring in two comic books and trade them in for a brand new different comic books so they had a good trade going and they're all beat up and everything but she has very fond memories of this and uh you know the phantom was one of those characters or whatever that she remembered very well from this time in her life so um when i was speaking to the publisher about doing this i you know i i wasn't expecting him to act on this i just said i i relate to him the story i just told you and i said i'm very happy to be doing this cover and he said, oh, well, great. I'll send you a collection book to give to your grandmother, uh, you know, to your wife's grandmother. And I was like, yeah, that's really nice of you. Thank you. So, you know, a couple of weeks later, because it takes a while uh, for shipping, we got this big collected edition of these old classic phantom tales. And I gave them to Nanette. And she, there's, there's this lovely photo of her holding the book with her hand on her chest because it means a lot to her. Like it gives, it gave her a really warm feeling that reminds her of her father, reminds her of the old days. Um, and she did read, you know, she read that. She was telling me, did you know that there's more than one phantom and that it's a, um, a mantle that they pass down, you know? And so she was like telling me details that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was a really great experience. Um, so yeah, it was just the one cover I got to draw. I, I wish I could do, you know, more uh, mm -hmm. with that. But it's an Australian publisher. I got to see them briefly when we were in Australia last year as well. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing that story. Okay. My next fun question. I know you guys are big horror fans. Have you guys watched any horror movies in the last year? And what do you guys recommend? What would you recommend to any of our listeners? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so our, we began all of our um, heavy, the, the heavy intensity of our like, um, what is it? Renovating our old house and moving and stuff in October, unfortunately. So we, we kind of got cheated on our month long marathon of watching Halloween films. Cause we always do that every year, uh, usually. And, um, the one, so we didn't get to watch as many new, uh, or even old horror films last year. Uh, but the one that we saw was, uh, that, that stood out to me cause we were just flipping through the channels and I, I'm not going to know anyone's name. So <laughs> I don't know the name of the show. I don't know the name of the actors. But um, we're, we're fans of the TV show Supernatural and the actor who played Death in there, one of the horsemen, Death, who's like this older, very gaunt looking man. Uh, we were flipping, through, we were on Shudder, uh, mm -hmm. the horror movie streaming service. And as we were just looking around, there was, that actor was on there and he was giving just a very intense uh, 
not in performance, but he was like monologuing mm -hmm. uh, or having a dialogue with another character. And he's just a very watchable actor. So we were like, what is this? Because on Shutter, when you go there, usually it defaults to it's just like showing you whatever movies that they're in progress on showing, but you can then go and bring up another movie on demand. So we found out the name of that movie and then we watched it and it was like about this older man who's the actor who played death and supernatural and his wife who had lost their daughter and granddaughter in an automobile accident and that they're so dedicated to getting them back. Like their, their guilt is so high about their passing in this uh, car accident that they get involved in like this, this uh, cult that's they're trying to like invoke a spirit into a, a body. I, and so they're, they're coming from, and the actors are great. And it's a very, like, just from a creative standpoint, it's called, it, it would be almost like a bottle type movie where it only takes place in like two or three different sets. It's not like this, there's no car chases, there's no gun, well, I'm sorry, there's no big gun battles, there's a gunshot. Um, but it's a great, it's a great movie. Um, so I, I would recommend it if you can track it down from those very nebulous details <laughs> that I just gave you. It's on Shudder, it's got the actor who played Death and Supernatural, you know, which okay. I look that up. Um, but uh, I'm trying to think if there's any others. Uh, but on like on Halloween, we just usually watch the Halloween movies. Mm -hmm. And so that was, and it was a beautiful day last year on Halloween. So we had all the windows open at the house and the studio and we're watching Halloween movies all day. It was pretty nice. That's pretty cool. Um, okay. Um, do you want to give a shout out to your um, local comic shops? Sure, yeah. There are <clears throat> three comic shops that have always supported my work. I like the guys who run up, run them. Um, and if you have a chance, you know, I hope that you support them. So the, the closest one physically to me is Pulp Fiction Comics and Games. Mm -hmm. And it's in Lee Summit, Missouri. And then um, the next one would be A Million Comics. And that's, they have a couple of different locations, um, but in, in like Overland Park. And then there's another one, um, Last but not least is uh, Elite Comics. Those are the three comic shops that I frequent um, and that I, that they've always supported me. I've done signings at all their stores, you know, a while back, of course, before a pandemic. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you guys can support them, that'd be awesome. Okay. Um, also too, um, what is your favorite takeout place um, in your city? Uh, our favorite takeout place. Oh, and I should start off, like, if you don't, and just give me, a, like, what town do you guys, what city do you guys live in right now? Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, we, we actually moved not very far from where we were living previously. So we're still, like, outside of Kansas City. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, but we're just a little further on the Missouri side. So, but um, let's see, local, recently, I've been enjoying, uh, this is not very sophisticated food, but uh, there's, like, a convenience store called Casey's. Mm -hmm. And they have really, really good cheese pizza. And if you ask them to put on extra cheese, they'll actually do it. Uh, I say that because sometimes if you're ordering uh, like delivery pizza, you'll ask for extra cheese and it's still like this thin layer of cheese. It's like they never, mm -hmm. they put less, less cheese on it or something, you know, um, which is annoying. So uh, Casey's, but aside from that, um, there's a, a burger place that was very popular. And for a while it was only, it only existed in New York called Shake Shack. Um, but they've recently in the last like year or so opened up a couple locations around here. Oh. And Shake Shack has just really, really, it, really good burgers that are on the level or better than Five Guys for, um, burgers. So if you ever had those, I don't know. But um, Shake Shack is excellent. They have a really good smoked burger. Um, I don't know. And then, I mean, actually my wife Kiki is a heck of a cook. So she, she, what she makes is usually my favorite version of that thing, whatever she's made. It kind of ruins me for other restaurants. So like her falafel and hummus is the best that I've ever had. And her version of Thai food is the best I've ever had. So um, I, I would guess if she ever opens a takeout place, that would be the one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to let you know. So five guys. Yeah, I think in Hawaii, they opened up a couple locations here on Oahu within the last couple of years. So, uh -huh, okay. Yeah, uh, have you had them before? I mean, do you know what I'm talking about with yeah, Five Guys? I, yes, I'm gonna okay. because I think last year during the uh, during the shutdown, me and my wife we yeah we just like ordered um, 
yeah, we ordered a burger, you know, we ordered, you know, we ordered takeout from them just one time. It was, it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But no, yeah, well, I think Shake Shack is, you know, maybe edges them out a little bit as far as my favorite burger. Um, but on a side note, when we were there in at the, you know, for the Honolulu show, um, we ate some, <clears throat> um, let's see, Moco Loco. Um, oh, the local mocos, yeah. Yeah, the spam wasubi. I, I'm going to oh. say all these wrong, I'm no, sure. No. But, um, and what else was it? There was something else, uh, something else that had spam in it. And I, when I was growing up, my mom had always told me, don't even bother with spam. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, she was acting like, my mom was acting like it was a, you know, it's even worse than bologna. You know, bologna is like, something that we would buy and I like bologna mm -hmm. but she you know didn't want me eating that and she thought spam was was worse or whatever so I had this like undue prejudice against spam when um when I was growing up so I hadn't even given spam a second thought until last year when we were there uh for the Honolulu show and I loved it the, mm -hmm. the way it was being prepared was fantastic and so now we we regularly have spam, spam fried rice. We have mocha loco with spam um, with some of our breakfasts. She'll make that instead of bacon at the Kiki Will. Um, it's fantastic. So that, that was all credited to our experience there last year. So just for our <laughs> listeners, I just want to describe the loco moco. Basically what it is, is like a, it's on a, like there's a pile of rice, pile of brown gravy, and it depends on certain restaurants that they'll either give you one hamburger patty or two hamburger patties mm -hmm. and um, a sunny side egg on top of that. <laughs> so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. We introduced it to our, uh, my best friend, Pat, who is, you know, he's like number one. Uh, he, he's a great guy. Um, but he, he came over and Kiki introduced him to it and he ate, I, I, I was shocked by how much he ate that he did not explode his own stomach because it was just, he just couldn't, he was like, oh my God, I've never had these flavors. I've never had it. And, and that's how I felt too. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just, a, it was a delight to see somebody enjoying it so much for the first time. So mm -hmm. that's, wonderful. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to tell our listeners too, it's very fattening. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a health food for sure. It's just it's just delicious, you know. Yes. Um, would you like to promote your social platforms before I start wrapping up? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I earlier said freddyart.com. That's the main uh, my main website, and it has links to my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, all that stuff. But um, if you just go, I mean, the the easiest one to remember is freddyart.com. And then aside from that on Instagram and Twitter, which is where I'm the most, uh, I don't know, the, the most active, um, I'm at freddyart. So uh, Freddy is spelled with an I-E. be pretty easy to find. Okay. And then the final question, any last words to our listeners? Oh, thanks for, yeah, thanks for following along with us on this journey. And thanks for being supportive of my work over the years. And, uh, you know, every, and, and also try your best to have some sense of normalcy in this, in these weird times. It feels like we're on the upswing in a positive way, but, you know, it's, it's good to have your interests and hobbies as small escapes from reality, but, you know, but even, st even still reality itself can be, turned into positives even though there's challenges involved so uh that's not me trying to sound wise it's it's partially i have to remind myself of that stuff too mm -hmm. freddie i'm going to say thank you very much for your time thank you for agreeing to do this interview thank you very much my pleasure and yeah thank you for for being an awesome host and just for uh brightening our day whenever we see you online and stuff thank you very much <laughs> all right until next time guys aloha Aloha. Thanks. That was my interview with Freddie Williams II, co-creator and artist on the bequest from Aftershock Comics. Um, it was great talking to Freddie um, again, you know, about this series. You know, I read the first issue and I loved it. You know, I love Freddie's artwork on the villain Epcot and I love Freddie's um, artwork on dragons in the book. During the interview, I forgot to mention um, that Freddie is also working with colorist Jeremy Caldwell. Freddie and Jeremy have worked on, you know, all three Batman Ninja Turtle crossovers. And Jeremy's um, colors in this first, first issue 
are great. It's very vibrant and it pops off the page. You know, so um, if you guys get a chance, if the first issue is still um, available at your shops, please pick up the first issue. The bequest number two comes out on April 21st. You know, now the movie that, the horror movie that Freddie was talking about, and I hope I got this right, it's called Anything for Jackson. It came out in 2020, and I believe this is the actor um, that Freddie was referring to that played um, Death in the Supernatural TV series. And that actor's name is Julian Richings. Now, this is the part of the podcast I want to give a few shout outs to. You know, um, I want to thank Freddie for his time. Freddie, thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for answering my questions. Thank you very much. And also, Freddie, thank you very much for keeping in touch with me, you know, to schedule this interview. Again, Freddie, thank you very much. You know, and for you listeners, please, if you get a chance, check out his website. It's freddieart.com. And it's um, F R. E D D I E A R T dot com, and we'll have it in the show notes. Now, you know, I also want to thank um, Drew, um, the co host for Comics for Fun and Profit, for letting me contribute um, to his podcast, you know, and for doing all the heavy lifting behind the scenes in putting this episode together. You know, so Drew, thank you very much. If you are a new listener to the Comics for Fun and Profit podcast, Please check out their weekly episode that comes out every Saturday. My Ohioan brothers, Drew and Kyle, do spec picks of new releases that comes out every Tuesday and Wednesday. And lastly, you know, I want to thank you, the listeners. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you very much for listening to this episode. Thank you very much. Until next time, guys. Aloha.